right, we are in a series of messages from the gospel according to John, and I want to invite you, whether it is, you can use a pew Bible if you don't have a Bible of your own with you today, and I hope that you'll open your Bible. One of the things that keeps us from Christ, keeps us from growing in Christ, keeps us from obedience in, to Christ, is just not spending time in God's Word, and so we want to practice that a little bit when we get together at church on Sundays, so Use a pew Bible, use your Bible, use your electronic version of the Bible, but let's get in the Bible because we're going to preach from 71 verses of the Gospel of John today, and you're going to need to follow along, or you're going to be really lost. Uh, this is the, one of the longest, uh, longest set of verses we're going to run into in John, and we're going to cover the whole thing today, so hang on to something. All right. Now, John chapter 6 is where we are this week, and we find... A big difference between John and the other three Gospels. You got Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and then you have John. And Matthew, Mark, and Luke have a lot in common. They're similar in a lot of different ways. Then John is a different kind of guy. Here's one of the things you're going to find is that Matthew, Mark, and Luke spend most of their time in Galilee. Jesus' first two years of his ministry, mostly centered around the Galilean ministry. Now, John, he's going to spend overwhelmingly the majority of his time in and around Judea, Jerusalem area. So when John wrote his gospel, one of the things interesting about him is that he only records a couple of miracles during the Galilean ministry where the other guys are focused in miracle stuff. Just a couple of things. First one, the feeding of the 5,000. The second one, which comes right out of the story of feeding the 5,000, both of them are found in John 6. Jesus walking on the water. And so we're going to touch on those as well as several other things. But this is the big chapter where Jesus lays down one of his big statements. I am the bread of life. Now, I want to read. This is a big deal too because we're getting the first hints in this chapter of uh, Jesus beginning a different journey. When he leaves Galilee... And he's going, to make some, he's going to make some excursions down into Jerusalem because as a Jewish man, he's supposed to go to Jerusalem for the big feast days. And so we've already seen Jesus, even in the Gospel of John, he's made it down to Jerusalem a few times. But he's about to focus everything that last year was ministry around Jerusalem because, because he has an appointment with the cross. And we're going to see that transition take place, chapter 6. So here's John, chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. After this, Jesus has been teaching He's had the disciples out working. After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now, the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. That verse 4 is really important. Lifting up his eyes then and seeing that large crowd that was coming toward, a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? And verse 6 says, he said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Jesus always does. So that verse 4, the key part about verse 4 is it dates when this took place. It was in the springtime of the year. It's a time when, especially around Galilee, springtime, uh, the, the hills would have been covered in green grass. So it would have been a pretty time of year, inviting time of year. The multitudes who were following Jesus everywhere, he talks about. This is up in Galilee, in the northern part of the country. They're following him. It's bigger and bigger crowds because they've seen the miracles. They've heard about the miracles. They want to see the next big miracle. But here's the weird part of the story. It's Passover season. They weren't supposed to be in Galilee. The crowds were supposed to be heading to Jerusalem. Every Jewish man was supposed to spend those feast days in Jerusalem. And he usually took the families with him. This was probably the low attendance day for Passover in the whole first century. Because all these people who should have been in Jerusalem were with Jesus in Galilee. Now... John included this to indicate why Jesus did what he did in John chapter 6. These multitudes are following him everywhere. Didn't want to miss out on the next big miracle. Jesus is the best show in town. 
He's doing things no one else has ever done. They're fascinated by him. He's always interesting. And there's a, there's a momentum to what Jesus is doing. This is the place to be. This is the guy to be with. And there are crowds. If you compare the gospel accounts, one of the things you find is that in Mark's gospel, Mark says, there's so many people coming and going, he didn't even have time to eat. You ever have that experience? You get so busy, you just don't even have time to eat. So many people. What we also find is that just before everything that takes place in John 6, we compare the other gospels, Jesus has sent out his disciples, the 12, two by two, and they have been practicing what he's been modeling. Jesus teaches it, he models it, he sends them out to try it. And so, in, again, the other Gospels you find, they just came back and they said, Jesus, we can't believe this. It's transferable. What you did, we're able to do. God's working through us too. And, you, and it, we can't believe what's been taking place, how incredible this is. And, but they're weary. Jesus is weary. And they're just breaking away from the multitudes for a bit. And so what happens in this, in this chapter is that Jesus, he's on the... He's on the west side, northwest side of the Sea of Galilee, and they just get in a boat, and they cut across to the northeast side, just kind of trimming the top off the Sea of Galilee to get away from all the people for just a little bit. And they go up to a high place. Jesus needs to spend some time, first of all, just re in recuperating, but, but downloading more back and forth with the disciples after their, their journey. Well, their, their missionary mission trip they've been on. So... The multitudes watch this, and they see, okay, they're in a boat, and they're heading that way. And they just start running around the northern part of the Sea of Galilee. Now, it's rugged terrain. You can't go very fast. It's a hard trek, but they're trekking. And they make it around. Jesus has already gotten up to his spot with his disciples. And then it's kind of like, oh, Jesus loves people, and he has compassion on them. But sometimes, you know, you feel like Jesus is just going, oh, man. Because sometimes he says that about me. Oh, man, really? He makes it all the way. <laughs> here he is up here. They're in a high place. And here come, the, here come the crowds. And, you know, in the other gospels, we get that word. Jesus had compassion on them. He feels for them. And his response, he determined to do something for them. He knew, Jesus knew, ordinarily, they ought to be in Jerusalem. This is Passover season. And in his heart, he decides, well, they're not going to be in Jerusalem for Passover, so we're going to create a Passover feast here. We're going to create uh, some opportunity here. And Jesus, who, in verse 6, knew himself what he would do. On this occasion, he gives the disciples, and this is true often with Jesus, there's a push, there's teaching, there are events, he models stuff, they do stuff, and they come back, and then he says, okay, so how's that going for you? He, he tests them out. So, you getting this? Is this making sense? When he asked, he asked the disciples at Caesarea Philippi, so what are people saying about me? What's the public opinion poll about what we're doing? And, well, they, they had all that. This time, another exam. So, what do you think we ought to do about this crowd of people? And, and he starts the exam with old Philip. Philip, how are we going to feed all these people? Well, Philip's a practical guy. And Philip looks around and says, well, we, we got a big bag of nothing here. We don't have, we don't have the resources. There, there's, not a, there's not a Costco or a super Walmart or something we're going to be able to tap into for this. If we had the money, there's small villages. There's no place to go. We're really outgunned on this one. We're out of our league, over our heads. We got nothing. Philip says, I am in a predicament where there is no human solution. And I'm going to ask a series of questions today, and they're diagnostic type questions. And here's the first one Is Jesus enough? Does Jesus satisfy when you face the impossible? Is he enough in that situation? Is he everything that you're going to want in that situation? Has this ever happened to you? And some of you are in that spot right now where you're faced with a predicament and you say, I don't have the resources to handle this. I, I can't make this change. I can't make this better. Um, no answer. And that's what Jesus did with Philip. 
And Philip again, he started adding up money, how much money they had between them. They never had very much money. And he says, we're, we're in the realm of the impossible. Now, Andrew, Andrew's always a faith guy. And he's, we find him in the Gospels bringing people to Jesus. And so it's Andrew who finds this kid who has his little basket. If you were traveling somewhere, you had a little basket you carried with you. It had some basic food in it. It wasn't a big basket. It wasn't it, five loaves, two fish. These loaves are very small biscuits, and these fish are more like sardines. This is not a whole lot of food, but that's what the kid has. And Andrew says, well, I got this. And he thought, and that's looking pretty small with a multitude sitting out there. But, but maybe... Maybe a little bit in Jesus' hands becomes more, more than a little bit. And so they hand it to Jesus, and Jesus, with a little bit, uh, well, that's all Jesus needed. A little bit of faith, a little bit of step, and Jesus can do something amazing. Now, the Bible tells us that the number of men in the crowd that day was 5,000. Now, we, we start figuring, okay, so a lot of them, they'd be traveling, they'd have a spouse with them, they'd have uh, kids with them. So easily, these numbers start swelling toward 15, 20,000 people. This is an enormous crowd, an overwhelmingly uh, complicated situation. And Jesus has them sit down on those grassy hillsides, and he prayed, and he took that little bit of nothing of bread and fish, and he just starts dividing it and he starts handing it to the disciples and the disciples start handing it to the people and they just keep that going and they keep that going and they keep that going until not only have they all gotten to something but they are all satisfied they have everything they could ever want they are all full up and then you end up with 12 baskets of leftovers because there's more than a mass multitude can consume because Jesus has everything that they need and then we get verses 14 and 15. Now verses 14 and 15 say, When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, This is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. Now that's a good, that's a good call. This is the promised one of God. They finally got something right. He's not just a guy who does tricks. He's the real deal. This is somebody. Then they take a wrong turn. Perceiving... This is Jesus perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king. Oh, man, you were so close, guys. Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. So they reached the proper conclusion. He's the promised one of God. They immediately acted the improper way. Let's make him king. What better guy to be king? A guy who can dish out free food. This is, this is fantastic. What a guy. Man, this, remember, this is... Uh, we spent, a lot of us now have been on mission trips where we spent time in a third world environment. You get in a third world environment, you find people spend a large portion of the day just preparing, eating, and cleaning up for mealtime. That it is so all-consuming, just mealtime. And they just show up and they've never had fast food in their whole lives. And so they got fast food up in Galilee. This is awesome. Let's just follow this guy. He is powerful and he's able and he's taking care of us. He's meeting basic needs. He's made life simple. All is well. See, they, they wanted him to become king. They weren't ready to follow him as Messiah king. They just wanted him to be producing king. Get things done for us, King. Take care of our needs, King. Follow our program. Follow our schedule. Do what we need you to do. And before we judge them too harshly, uh, boy, don't we do the same thing? Now, this story is given to teach us that that's just not how a relationship to God should look and should work. God is not a vending machine. So that brings us to the second question. So is Jesus enough or do you need to redefine him? Do you need to make him something else, something other, something more personalized? Our greatest privilege is to see ourselves as clay in God's hands, as, as, as his instruments, doing what he wants, not him doing what we want. And this lesson, uh, it had to be just engraved on the, the hearts, the minds of Jesus' disciples after this event, that they were to be his followers 
We don't define him. He does all the defining. He defines who we are. He defines what we do. He defines what's important and what's not. He defines what is right and what is wrong. He's the definer. And we don't define him according to, well, the Jesus I believe in, the, the reduction version of Jesus that, that, that is basically an idol, is so much less than the one revealed in the Word of God. In verse 16, we find the disciples crossing the Sea of Galilee. If you look at it in the context again, comparing all the Gospels, what happens is the people say, we want to make, we want to make him king. And it's in that context, Jesus says, okay, guys, he takes his disciples. The, all these people, the multitude wants to make him king. Disciples, uh, you guys get in the boat, just get out of here. They were not helping the cause. They were jumping on the bandwagon. So he had to get them out of there. So he's sending them now from northeastern side of the Sea of Galilee back to Capernaum, which is their uh, headquarters, sort of the uh, northwestern side of the Sea of Galilee. He sends them off. It says he dispersed the crowd. And then Jesus went up in the mountains to pray because he was gonna, he's exhausted. All of this stuff has been going on. But how does he replenish himself? By spending time with the Father. Uh, he didn't take a nap. He didn't binge on Netflix. He spent time with the Father. And teaches us a lot about what you do when you're spent. How you refresh your soul. When your soul is, is dry and tired and weary and uh, exhausted. So, Jesus sends them away. And they start crossing the sea. Well, there's just a lot up there in the Sea of Galilee. That when the, water starts, the wind starts whistling between those hills. And it hits the water. It can become so violent so quickly. And these guys are experienced on the Sea of Galilee, but they find themselves in a spot where they're rowing hard and they're doing all they can do, but they, they are in danger. And Jesus comes walking to them on the water. In the other Gospels, we get more of that story than we get from John, but Here's what we, we get. They were afraid when they saw him. And what is the first thing Jesus says? Don't be afraid. That always comes next, right? Happens with Jesus. Happens with angels. Happens all the time. They were all afraid. And you know, that's a freak out moment. You see Jesus, even Jesus walking on the water in the middle of a storm. Do not be afraid. And he stepped into the boat. And they were instantly found themselves at the shore at Capernaum. Right where they were headed. Now, third question. Is Jesus enough when the storm surrounds you? When, when it seems impossible, when, when if you, and God wants you to use your own skills and he doesn't want you just to sit and be uh, complacent and lazy. But sometimes when you've been fighting the waves and you're trying harder and harder and you're soldier on and you're just not getting anywhere, just know this, the same Jesus who walked on the water is still available to you today and he can do things you just can't do. He's enough. He can satisfy those big sweeping needs in your life. Now, there was a multitude and they had been fed by Jesus. It was all a miracle and the disciples knew it, but these folks knew a miracle has taken place at such a very high level. And so now, they're retracing their steps. They're running back around the northern part of the Sea of Galilee. They're heading to Capernaum too, going east to west, looking for Jesus. And Jesus confronts them with these words. Now we're in verse 26, chapter 6. Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, you were seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. In other words, they were all enthralled with the food, and they were missing out on the fact the Savior was in their midst. The Messiah had come. Everything that they've been waiting for for centuries, the prophets had pointed toward. It was all right there. He was with them. And all they had to do was ask for this true bread of heaven. For eternal life was within their reach because of Christ. And they're, they're just saying, 
you got another meal you can hand off to us? Is there some more bread? And Jesus shocked them, startled them by saying, this is one of his seven great I am statements. I am the bread of life. This is verse 35. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. There are a couple things about this. First of all, he he has declared he is a daily need of people's lives. So bread, it's, it's the foundation of their diet in this culture. There are different things in different cultures that uh, the cornerstone of daily diet. Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. Give us this day our daily bread was a prayer. Jesus taught, the, taught his followers that it's not a loss to us because we tend to have all the food we need and we have stockpiles of it in a pantry and we're not worried about daily stuff. But for these folks, they ate today. They weren't sure if they would eat tomorrow. It was complicated, and it was, it was a little, uh, little hazardous to think it's going to be there tomorrow too. Jesus said, you need me every day, not just on the Sabbath, not just in a crisis. You're going to need me every day. I am the bread of life. The other part is when he said, I am, he's declaring he's God. This is one of those foundational things in the Gospel of John. Jesus is God is the big sweeping theme of this gospel. And Jesus is going to say it again and again in multiple ways. And all that that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing you might have life in his name. So I am, he shares that covenant name for God that that God revealed to Moses from the burning bush. And every Jewish person who would have heard him say, I am the bread of life, would have made the connection immediately. He just said he's God. And and that's kind of big. And that's kind of offensive to some people. And it's certainly hard to hard to embrace just now. I am. That phrase speaks of this self-sufficient existence that only belongs to God. There was never a time when he was not. He has always been. He always will be. He is. He is the great I am. And the Jews automatically understood. He is claiming deity. And so they respond in verse 42. This is my paraphrase. Who does this guy think he is? Isn't this just Joseph's son? Isn't he just a guy? He's, He's stretching it out a little bigger than he ought to. And that brings us to our fourth question. Is Jesus enough... Are you really looking for something else? Is he enough? Does he satisfy? Are you you looking for a Jesus 2.0 or a in an addition to kind of Jesus? Jesus said, verse 47, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. He declares it again. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. He's referring back to the time of Moses. They were in the wilderness wanderings for 40 years. God provided manna every day. He said, yeah, God provided this miraculous bread every day. He fed them every day. That's what you guys want me to do. Those guys still died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. Oh, this is a whole different story. Jesus shifted gears In a dramatic way, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. You're putting your faith in what Jesus has done, who Jesus is, that you can live forever. And the bread that I give for the life of the world is my flesh, his body, his blood. Why would anyone look elsewhere for forgiveness? Why would you look somewhere else for meaning? Why would you look somewhere else for for joy and purpose? And why would you look somewhere else for eternal life? Why would you want something else? Why would you want someone else? And here's the answer. People walk away all the time. People are walking away from this story all the time. On a regular basis, it is offered up this all-sufficient story of Jesus. And people walk away from it. The Bible says, Jesus said, the way is narrow that leads to life and few are those who find it. That it's offered up for all, but most people are going to walk away because they say, that's just, I don't think that Jesus satisfies. 
I don't think that's what I really want. I'd like to do, I think my joy and my purpose is going to come from other places besides that. And I'm going to find it there instead of being satisfied with Jesus. So with all Jesus did and all Jesus said, for most people, it's just not enough. Because it's not what they want. It's not the way they want to live life. It's not how they want to do eternity. We, we live in this world where we, we're a bunch of redefiners. And Jesus confronted the redefiners. I just want to give a different definition. They're imaginary Jesus. A lot of people I run into. And we've been out sharing with so many folks in the city. And we get a lot of redefiners. They, Jesus, let me tell you about the Jesus I believe in. He's different than this guy. He's like this. He's shaped, formed, just the way I want him to be. He works for me. He's a handy partner who takes orders the way I want him to take orders. He's a, he's a fixer. Jesus confronted the redefiners in verse 54. And boy, this is a tough statement from Jesus. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. They would have freaked out at that statement. And I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. So here's Jesus. Jesus never says, okay, discipleship. Whatever you want it to be. Just, I'll make the rung on that ladder so low anybody can take it. Jesus says it's super high. And this statement, it, it repelled the crowds. Uh, people ran from this. Uh, he, he talked about, now Jesus, I mean, he balances it. Jesus talks about these incredible benefits, eternal life, forgiveness of sin, he, to abide with him, relationship to him. The benefit package is unbelievable. But there's a commitment. There's a surrender. There, there's, there's more than casual Christianity that's involved. And how do people respond? Most people walk away. Fifth question. Is Jesus enough? Or is he really more than you want? Is he? he uh, I, on, on this occasion, with this multitude, still maybe in the neighborhood of 15, 20,000, that is way too much Jesus for these folks. Do you want a Jesus that asks things of you? Do you want a Jesus who demands commitment, demands following kind of discipleship? Now, we live in this self-defining, self-identifying world where we, we want to create our own realities and our own truth. And most people don't want a Jesus that he's determined in how life is to be done and how eternity works. Do you want a Jesus who just shakes you right out of your comfort? Most people enjoy comfort too much. Here's the path Jesus took with his disciples. He raised the bar. He explained the cost of discipleship. He offered the benefits of believing in him, but also what it required. And it was re going to require more than being a fan of Jesus, being a groupie, being a... Hey, if there's a parade, I always love a parade, and I'm jumping in with where the flow of popular is... Looking for more, we talk about cultural Christianity today. There's a lot of people say, well, you know, kind of a, it's a sort of still, a, even, even with a lot of other things out there now, it's still a, mostly a Christian culture in our country and in our area. And, and that's just what you're supposed to do. And you can define it any way you want to underneath that umbrella. But and for these folks, uh, they just walked away. Now, these people were willing to follow Jesus when it was easy, when it was popular, when Jesus was doing what, he, what they wanted him to do, when it was just the pipe. It was where the parade was going. They were all over it, but then when discipleship got defined, when expectations were made clear, they fell away. And John tells us, verse 66 through 69, after this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, do you want to go away as well? Again, this is, a, this is a defining time. Do you want to go away as well? And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? 
You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. We talked about this last week when we talked about the things, the why of suffering in the world, suffering in our lives. And people sometimes in times of difficulty and suffering, they just say, I'm stepping away from God. God's not meeting my needs. God's not, taking, God's not protecting me from everything and I'm walking away. Same story in this passage where Peter says, yeah, everybody else is leaving, but where are we going to go? Where, where else are we going to find the help that we need? Where else are we going to find someone who will join us in the middle of the storm? Where else are we going to find one who has the words of life, who is the bread of life? And for Peter, he just declared, Jesus is enough. You know, all my life, one of the heartbreaking things for me is uh, people walking away from God. And uh, I feel the burden of it, and I feel the, the darkness of it. Because, it, you know, God just, he wasn't what I was looking for. Jesus wasn't satisfying enough. And so I'm going to throw myself into a hundred other things to keep myself occupied. And here's the call of today. Jesus really, he has everything you need. Jesus satisfies. And, and I want to encourage you. Turn to Jesus. For some of you, it's a return to Jesus. To come back to, instead of an imaginary Jesus, and most people who talk about Jesus, it's good to ask them, tell me about the Jesus you believe in. Oh, I believe in Jesus. Tell me about the Jesus you believe in. And it's a, it's a homemade, imaginary Jesus, not the one in the Bible. Not this Jesus, not John 6 Jesus. It's a made-up Jesus. So here's how this chapter ends. And this is, this is kind of dark. We started out in John. It's just Jesus. And he calls out his first disciples. And he's got a couple. Then he has four and then he adds up, he's got his 12. And then other people start joining him. And then you get to the feeding of the 5,000. We may have 15, 20,000 people. It's a huge multitude. And then you finish the sixth chapter. And it's back down to pretty much those 12 guys again. And everybody else has bailed. They, they all just walked away. Because they didn't really want the real Jesus. And from this point forward, every step Jesus takes is a step toward the cross. He's heading south. He's going to Jerusalem, and he has an appointment with the cross. And John's going to spend the rest of his gospel on that journey. Will Jesus be enough? Will you be satisfied with Jesus? Today, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper. And Jesus said, this is my body. This is my blood. Same thing he threw out to those folks. Do this in remembrance of me. And most of you, if you've been around church life for a while, you know what to expect in the Lord's Supper. There's a little cup of uh, grape juice to remind us of Jesus' blood. And there's a, there's a little piece of bread to remind us of his body, all given for us, the price for sin paid at the cross. And you're going to have that. We call it the Lord's Supper. And, uh, but we would also say, well, it's getting, uh, it's getting on toward 1130, and I'm hungry. And I'm pretty sure that's not going to fill me up. But one of the things it reminds us of, it's not supposed to fill you up. It's supposed to remind you that the longing of your heart, the empty places that need to be filled, the deficits that, that need to be met, Jesus satisfies. It's not about this satisfying. It's the Jesus it represents that satisfies. He's the one that fills it all in. And you can find everything you need in him if you will really turn your heart to Jesus, to trust him in everything, to find in Jesus all you need and all that you could want and all that satisfies the deepest hungers of your life and the eternal things that matter. And if there is nothing else, if there's nothing else in your life, is Jesus enough And I just want to, I want to, don't walk away. My friend uh, Steve Besner, preaching a sermon.
touched on some of this context. He was a different, different message, but it was a good illustration. I'm going to borrow it from him. So we say, here's the bread of life. Fantastic. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And we say, hmm, so that's the bread of life. Well, you know, forgive as I've been forgiven? Oh, you got to be kidding me. That's crazy talk. You have no idea what people have done to me. Uh, love people? Do you know people? They're crazy. Loving people? There's no thanks. Um, Jesus, the only way to heaven? Well, that's a bit exclusive, isn't it? Doesn't that, doesn't that take out a lot of nice people that I've known? Jesus, the only way? Oh, that, that can't be right. Not in this story. Uh, oh, be kind to the poor. Shouldn't the poor just go get a job? Isn't that what they say on Fox News? That must be true. I'm not sure about their motivations. I'm not sure what they're trying to pull. So, care for the poor? I think the poor should care for themselves. Those stories, part in the Red Sea, a bunch of animals on a boat, that walking on the water thing kind of freaks me out. I am more of a person of science. I can't believe that miracle stuff. And the money, oh, the money part. Whew. Be generous. Everything I have belongs to God. I work too hard to believe that. Oh, well, all that stuff the Bible says about sex. Okay, yeah, that's got to go. You talk about your outdated stuff. We don't need any of that. Uh, tell, tell other people about Jesus? That's not anywhere on my radar. It doesn't need to be. Somebody will take care of that besides me. I can peel that one off. And All the things the Bible says are right and wrong. Isn't the Bible kind of judgmental sometimes? I think I can peel that back. Oh, but man, but I like this part right here. Jesus died on the cross for me so I can go to heaven forever and ever. Now, that's the part I'm going to hang on to. And we wonder why our version of Christianity, we wonder why, especially this Americanized version, this self-styled, form it the way we want it, imaginary Jesus version of Christianity, why it's so anemic and why we're so spiritually starved and why we're so dissatisfied because we have made it something Jesus never intended for it to be. And this is why we're not satisfied. Because we gave up, we gave up the feast that is offered to us because Jesus is the bread of life. We said we want a personal Savior. We have no interest in a personal Lord. This part can be pretty awesome. But I'm telling you, when you start self-styling it, you start redefining who this Jesus is right here. And it's not Jesus anymore. So, what if, what if, we just really went all in? What if we said, I don't want just a little piece of Jesus, a self-defined, dumb it down kind of Jesus. I want the whole thing. I want to feast on the bread of life. Oh, oh, what a life we would live. And what a blessed experience we'd have with our Savior who loves us so very much.